Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Hello, my name is Teresa Kennedy Dupay, and you're watching another episode of Oregon Voters Digest. I have two guests today, J.D. Chandler, writer, author, historian, and crime writer, and my husband, Don Dupay. And we're going to talk about local Portland politics and writing in general and anything else that we might decide to talk about. Hello, how are you guys? Hi. Glad to be here. I'm glad to be here, too. I'm sorry Bruce isn't here. Happy birthday, Bruce. Happy birthday, Happy birthday. Bruce, wherever you are. Yeah. It's, Bruce, it's Bruce's birthday today, yes. and he's not feeling well, and we hope that he gets better very soon. So I have some questions. Um, I'll start with you, J.D. What current writing projects are you working on? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, as you know, I published four books of Portland history with uh, the History Press, and I've come to a parting of ways with them. Mm -hmm. uh, the History Press was bought by a company called Arcadia Press. They don't treat their authors fairly, and I'm not going to be publishing any more books with them. I hope to continue with the Portland history, but now I need to find a publisher for that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Um, I am keeping my blogs up. Uh, for you regular readers of my blogs, you know I've been a little lazy, but I do intend to continue keeping those up. Slabtown Chronicle. Slabtown Chronicle uh, and the Weird Portland blog. Weird Portland. Uh, my big project at the moment is I'm uh, beginning the second season of Murder by Experts. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and you, I know you guys are a couple we of my love experts. It. <laughs> we love that show. It's fun. Uh, but we're going to be starting off the season uh, in the next few days. Probably by the middle of next week we'll have the, the uh, new episode posted. And we're looking at another unsolved crime from history. Um, it's, going, it's the Beehive Murder. Uh, that's uh, the death of a woman in 1881, and the last person to see her alive was Police Chief James LaPayas. Who wasn't the most honest person. He was not. <laughs> uh, and his theory of how she died was that she beat herself to death. Right. Um, Which seems kind of crazy. It does seem crazy. <laughs> yeah, what was internal affairs anyway? <laughs> So we're going to be acting as the Internal Affairs Department, looking at the police chief yeah. and a murder that he may have committed. It's kind of interesting looking back in history um, and reading those articles by the Oregonian because of the things that they leave out and just how kind of simple people were. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, so simple that they were really lacking in just basic logic. And I've, I've read a couple the two articles that exist, and what I was impressed by was the one doctor who was honest and said she had to have died by yeah at the hands of someone else yeah it, through homicidal violence it was interesting i think you i think dr cardwell i think is his name mm -hmm. and um we need to learn a little more about how they were investigating suspicious deaths in those days yeah. because it is interesting that um the coroner's jury ruled that she died by violence yeah but the chief insisted that she did not die by violence and never investigated the murder yeah um you know, it's I, I think it's fair to say that we should mention that the Beehive occupied most of a city block right now at Fifth and the Fifth and Oak. Yes. Or the bank, the huge bank building. Yeah, the U.S. Uh, bank temple is there now. It, I don't know if it occupied the entire block because we, that entire block yeah. is huge. That's true, and we don't know how big that building was yet. Yeah. I have a feeling it was on the south uh, southeast corner, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I mean it could have been on the southwest corner. <laughs> it is interesting though that it's in the U.S. U.S. bank uh, yeah. temple yeah. there. Yeah, and I. <laughs> You know, I, I've always wondered, you know, you walk downtown and you look at the old buildings that were built in 1910 and you wonder, you know, what was here in the 1880s, you know, yeah. what used to be here. Yeah. It's kind of fascinating to know that the Beehive used to be where the U.S. Bank is located currently. Yeah. And was the Tenderloin District. Right. The tenderloin. Close. It was close to the Tenderloin yeah. District. Yeah. Yeah. That's How true. Big was it? And yeah. the Tenderloin, was that called the Court of Death? The Court of Death. Yeah. Yes. Down at uh, Third and Yam Hill. Uh, That's it, so interesting. It's where and it's the same year, 1881, where where mm -hmm. the James Brown was murdered in Carrie Bradley's brothel there, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, a couple of years later, at Christmas time, Emma Merlotten was killed there in mm -hmm. the Tenderloin, the Court of Death area. Yeah. That was at Third in Yale, so a few blocks away from where the Beehive was. We need mm -hmm. to do some picture hunting <laughs> at the Oregon Historical Society, and but, there's a lot of a lot of places in town, a lot of uh, uh, vintage shops mm -hmm. have old photos, and sometimes you get lucky. But. Yeah. Well, the Beehive murder is going to be our continuing story mm -hmm. this year on okay. uh, murder by experts. So we'll do 
five or six episodes focusing on the case, mm -hmm. depending on how much we learn about it and okay. what comes out. Uh, we're also going to be looking at some other famous cases from Portland history this season, mm -hmm. the Mulugeta Seurat murder. Yes. Um, we'll look at the Starry Nightclub murder mm -hmm. where Tim Moreau was killed. Yeah. Uh, we're going to look at uh, the death of Leroy Clark mm -hmm. at Van's Olympic Room up on... Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, is that Vancouver Avenue? Don knew, Don Vancouver, knew, Fremont. yeah. Don and knew Leroy Clark, Don and knew, I knew yeah. Ken Misk. Yeah, and sadly. so so did Thomas Legg, <laughs> who's a new member of our mm -hmm. uh, panel of experts this year. Mm -hmm. Thomas Legg worked at the Pine Street Theater for many years, mm -hmm. and was very involved in the music scene. So he has mm -hmm. information on Larry Hurwitz, Tim Rowe, Ken Death. Um, so we're, it's going to be a really interesting season of uh, murder by experts, and I hope everybody's going to be listening. Yeah. Those are important stories, and I know that um, Ken Ken Misk or Ken Death, um, he did a short film with um, Gus Van Sant. Gus Van Sant. Ken Death goes to jail. Yep, is what it was called. I knew him in the '80s and went cruising with him and my younger sister and her boyfriend about three times, and it was a very interesting experience. It was kind of encapsulated the the wildness of the middle '80s. Yeah, and I'm going to be writing an essay about it. Well, this is interesting, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm wondering if, if people know what we're talking about. Uh, this is it's been a long time now oh. since Mulugeta Seurat died. Yes, and yeah. Ken Death was the young neo-Nazi who beat mm -hmm. him to death with right. a couple of other guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he did most of the damage. We're talking about things that happened a long time ago now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, particularly Leroy Clark, who yep. was the de facto manager of Van's Olympic Room, yep. yeah. which was one of the uh, hot spots, dirty spots, crime spots, uh, heroin uh, dealing, prostitution, uh, and it was managed by Leroy Clark, but owned by uh, Elwin Van Ripper. And didn't he work for Tom? Tom, uh, yes. Uh, he, he worked for uh, Tom Johnson. Tom Johnson, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So there's an interesting history there, and I have personal insight uh, about uh, old Mr. Leroy Clark and his girlfriend and our relationship yeah. together. It's kind of fun talking about these. It guys. is fun talking about this stuff. Yeah. I love going yeah. back and looking at the old crimes. Yeah. And when we and when we talk about the Leroy Clark situation, Don can refer to his book Behind the Badge in River City, yeah. a Portland police memoir, because there is one of the final chapters details that whole experience yeah. and inside information that John, that Don got from. Um, uh, and some people that he knew. I haven't picked a story <laughs> yet, but last year we dramatized one of the stories from Don's book, uh, A Little Bird Told Me. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so Bessie I'm, Staley. I'm yeah. looking for another story from the book that we could dramatize in that way. Because oh. mm -hmm. I, mm. I, I hope the listeners like that one. I particularly like that episode because I like playing around with radio drama. It's so much fun, and you do a great job. I don't know how to do all of that technical stuff, but mm -hmm. I, you know, I wrote a screenplay of one of the chapters in Don's book, um, Fool, Fool's Errand in Old Town, um, kind of an artsy screenplay, but um, that was one of my favorite chapters. Mm -hmm. It just... I'll look at that one again. Yeah, it's I haven't amazing. read the I haven't read the new edition yet, so I need to go through it. You haven't it. read the new story? I haven't. Oh, my gosh. there's a good story in there, okay. yeah. Clarence's Sidewalk Demise... Yeah. It's a wonderful, very graphic story, and the book really isn't meant for kids under 15. It's too graphic. <laughs> so to finish answering your question, okay. um, I'm continuing, continuing my focus on Portland history, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I've really kind of expanded my writing interests, mm -hmm. and I've been writing a lot of fiction. Mm -hmm. I've started a couple of different fiction projects and working on one now that uh, I'm really very happy with. It's a, a thriller. It's a political mm -hmm. thriller. Mm -hmm. um, something I haven't really written before. Mm -hmm. But I think it's going to be pretty good, and I'm having a lot of fun with it. You're, it's a novel, right? A novel. Cool, cool. So Do you have a working title? Nightingale. 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 That's nice. Yeah. That's always a, okay. That's a nice word. <laughs> the whistleblower. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot, of, a lot of meanings to it. You'll have to read the book to know. <laughs> so, Don, what are you doing? Or should I say, what are we doing? <laughs> well, the wildly popular first edition of my book prompted the second edition, which has been out... Uh, for a couple of months now. Uh, it has a lot more polar photographs in it. It has an additional story. And uh, it's pretty exciting because uh, it's getting a lot of recognition, too. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's still the Portland history. Uh, besides that, I am also doing fiction. Mm -hmm. My first attempt at fiction was is a story that's sitting on the shelf somewhere right now. It's called Frank's Revenge. It's a story about a, a kind of a down and out uh, private investigator who has his office in room number 10 at the Lotus Hotel downtown on 2nd Street. And uh, he's, a, he's enchanted by a, a woman that 
comes to him with a problem and he agrees to take on the case and that changes his whole life. So it's all Portland. Uh, I'm having crime scene photos of the actual crime scenes where these <laughs> ghastly murders take place. <laughs> And there are a lot of ghastly murders in here, so... Well, and what I've read of it, it's a good, tight detective story. Tight? Yes. yes. Yeah. It's very original. It's very original. It has a twist at the end. I'm hoping you don't know who the actual murderer is until <laughs> until the very end, and it's too late, anyway. It has some interesting characters. Yeah. And you're, we're also working on um, your second big book, um, which is called The Four Stories. Oh, The Four Stories. From yeah. the Hollywood Theater to the Benson Hotel. That's basically the title for right now. We might change it up a little bit, but it will stay pretty close to that. It's all pretty much memoir. Mm -hmm. I grew up here in Portland in the 50s, attended the Hollywood Theater every Saturday for matinee. So the first story is called The Hollywood Theater. And it's about growing up in the 50s and going to high school, grand high school, and uh, losing my virginity at the beach. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> that's the first story. The second story is my, about my time in the Navy when I went over to Germany and spent too much time over there. The third story uh, is, a, is a sad story about a young woman I was involved with for quite some time who was murdered, brutally murdered in Seattle. Mm -hmm. She was stabbed 27 times and thrown in a ditch in Seward Park in Seattle. Uh, the fourth story is a kind of a funny story because I worked for the Benson Hotel in the early 80s for six years as a director of security at a time when the Benson Hotel uh, was way back in the dark ages as far as safety and security and they key, didn't they didn't have any smoke key alarms. Control. There was not a smoke <laughs> detector in the entire building when I was there. This wonderful, beautiful, prestigious hotel was a fire trap. Wow. Yeah. So it's a funny story about the people who worked there and uh, the chefs who worked there and and some of the names had to be changed to protect the guilty. So, <laughs> so that will be out sometime. I hope in 2017. It's a good story. I'm proud of it. And I'm working on a book of fiction, too. Um, I've written creative nonfiction for over 30 years, and this past year I finally decided I would experiment with fiction writing, and it's been so much fun because it's so freeing. But I'm working on a collection of short stories, and I just found an incredible editor that's going to help me edit them a piece at a time. Um, he's amazing, and uh, it will be called... Uh, Burnside Field Lizard and Collected Stories, and it will be about street people and very Portland-esque, you know, a lot of, um, you know, areas in Portland that people probably don't remember. For example, 12th and Burnside, um, uh, where Sandy and Burnside meet that fork on 12th Avenue. Um, there used to be an empty field there, and now it's a building uh, where they do rock climbing. When it was an empty field, a lot of the prostitutes on Sandy would gather there during the spring and the summer and so I'm writing a story about that's the main story inside field I've read that story and it was a really good one <laughs> you read that one I did <coughs> yeah. so another um, sad sad part of our disappearing history in Portland is Frank's revenge his office is in the Lotus yeah which is now yeah. all boarded up and soon to be torn down it's true so. the Lotus is scheduled for demolition yeah. it's the and it's just about the, the last of the old tender it is yeah it's it the is last. The and Lotus. especially in that neighborhood yeah. which that was neighborhood, yeah. that neighborhood historically has been so important to the mm -hmm. city mm -hmm. and almost all of the buildings well the Multnomah County Courthouse is the only one yeah. Yeah. that's going to remain uh, in the two parks but. it's it's so discouraging because uh, Don and I and several other people went to City Hall, I think it was November 18th, and we spoke in front, you know, we spoke in City Hall, and a lot of people spoke defending the importance of the Lotus and the ancient order of the United Workman Temple, mm -hmm. which is just around the corner from the Lotus, which has also been taken off the protected list. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are really angry about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we're angry because the Lotus, number one, is rock solid. It would probably cost several million to get it up to code and to, to rebuild it, but it could have been done, and now it's going to be demolished. Well, and we've done so much mm -hmm. good work with rebuilding the old buildings. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I live close to Washington High School, this mm -hmm. Revolution yes, Hall now. Right. That They've done an excellent job of restoring that mm -hmm. building to its historical state, yeah. and it is beautiful. It is. I've seen it. It's yeah. gorgeous. And uh, and I I think that in terms of the, the developers and what they want to do, it's going to be a lot more difficult 
probably to demolish the ancient order of the United Workman Temple than the Lotus, because that is a huge building. Um, I'm just really hoping that someone does something and steps up. We have enough millionaires in the city of Portland who could, you know, who could do something, who could help. Well, and part of that is the difference in the history, because with the ancient order of workmen, this is an, an old labor organization. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a it's labor history. The Lotus yeah. Cafe, the history that happened there was history that the city's not wanting to remember. Right. Uh, the, the murder drinking, that happened. The drinking, the prostitution, right. the bartender that was killed there right. in the mm -hmm. 80s. Um, the Lotus has a very sketchy and shady history, yeah. so yeah. get rid of that one. And it's haunted. <laughs> So, Tish and I are fortunate to have pictures. We were allowed up there. Yeah, twice. Uh, a couple in the years ago. the old hotel part, yeah. and we got pictures of actual room number 10, mm -hmm. which was uh, where I arrested a prostitute and then morphed into Frank's office. Yeah. So, <clears throat> we got, a, I think I took over 150 photos with my cell phone, and I took a video. Mm -hmm. I would sure love to see those. Yeah, it's, um, it's pretty amazing. It's, um, you know, we walked down the hall and there were there was the old carpet in the center of all the halls and you couldn't hear a floor creak you couldn't hear a, 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 a the floorboards creak because it's yeah. it's just so solid mm -hmm. and it was interesting walking down the halls on those carpet carpets and you know walking down everything is just completely silent because it was so strong and sturdy and it just it's it's really saddening that it's going to be a shame yeah it's just the old glory, which was around the corner on First and Madison, is also gone. That's a big talk about another shady building. spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a shady spot. Yeah, I got into a lot of trouble in the old glory. And it's <laughs> mentioned in your book. Mm -hmm. yeah. Smokey Williams got killed in there one night. He uh, was uh, a neighborhood tough who was the man most likely to be murdered in the neighborhood. I believe, mean. <laughs> yeah. and he was. That's funny. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have a terrible sense of humor. Also. Uh, uh, the Old Glory was the last place that Officer Bobby Farron visited before, uh, yeah. before he right. before he didn't find who he was looking for there and mm -hmm. went off and uh, drove himself off the road and killed himself. Yeah. He uh, ended up losing control curve. of his vehicle on the mm -hmm. Terwilliger Curves yeah. in, I think, 1964. I think yeah. it was 64, yeah. yeah. And then died. That's, looking at that period, it's really amazing to me how many police officers died in car accidents. Yeah. Uh, you don't see that as much anymore, mm -hmm. but still, it's a... It's a almost as many as get shot. Well, and then the thing about that time also was that when they were working vice, they were drinking. So these yeah. cops were drunk. I mean, Don, yeah, he, it happened to Don, and he's just lucky that, you know, that he had the sense to use a uh, seatbelt because most people didn't I'm use totally seatbelts. I'm totally pretty darn, pretty darn sure that Bobby Farron was intoxicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, and one of the things that bothers me about that I have to mention is they cleaned up all the car parts and took it all away. They never found his gun. Oh, mm -hmm. weird. They never found these guns. So somewhere out there buried in the rubble mm -hmm. is probably a thirty-eight snub nose. Probably. You know, <clears throat> the block of Bobby Farron that they never found. I unless know, unless it was, go find it? Unless it was That's found weird. and, you know, and <coughs> disposed yeah. of. I mean, really, it was 1964, so we really don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when we spoke to the relatives of your first partner, Frank Josetus, mm -hmm. they told us that Frank Josetus was on to something and was yeah. uncovering corruption and felt very conflicted about it yeah. and Bobby Farron was his partner and yeah. when Bobby Farron was killed he was so depressed over his death that's partly why some people think he um, Frank Josetus committed suicide yeah. in 1965 plenty but, of sadness uh, to go around in the old days. yeah <laughs> yes. yeah definitely yes so um, we're supposed to talk about politics too <laughs> Good. So what All you, of these <coughs> things tie into politics, as yeah. far as I'm concerned. Okay. Tearing down our old buildings, yes. underfunding our police department. Mm -hmm. um, it all ties into politics. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the police department. Uh, one of the big deals that's going on in City Hall now is a conflict between the citizens and the commission over whether or not they should have signed a contract right. with right. the police. Uh, the commissioner's point of view is the contract needed to be signed because we are so short in policemen. There's 83 vacancies now and 20 or so more coming up immediately. Right. So we're going to be short 100 policemen. Uh, the response time of six minutes is unacceptable. Unacceptable. Yeah. And that's, dangerous to that's both. That's the 911 response policemen. time. Yeah, that yeah. is unacceptable. Both is dangerous to both the police officers and 
and the citizens who are counting on the policemen to show up. So. And, and currently what's happened is October 12th there was a, a protest gathering at City Hall and mm -hmm. at, I think around 1 o'clock or so, um, sometime in the afternoon, mm -hmm. the police pushed over 100 people out of the doors, the, um, the west side entrance exit, um, and several people were injured and the activists are, are very outraged by how they were treated. Um, there were elderly people there, there were women, apparently there were some kids. Um, and it turned into a melee. And uh, I'm outraged over how they were treated. I, I don't understand why Charlie Hales thinks that he can exclude Portland citizens from our city hall. Yeah. This is a democracy. This is a government of the people. And Charlie Hales is not our dictator. Um, I think the man needs to be impeached. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that he's going to be out of office in a few weeks, so there's probably not time to impeach him. So resign, Char Charlie. Yeah. I, what's interesting to me is... Um, uh, when I, I felt like when Don and I went to speak in November of last year about the two buildings, the Lotus and the Ancient Order of the United Workman Temple, I felt like they just, you know, we, we were just all going through the motions. Mm -hmm. They just wanted us to speak our piece so we could just get out and they were going to just do what they want. And I think that a lot of people in Portland feel that way too, that not only do what they, you know, they, they feel frustrated because they feel like what they are saying isn't being heard and it doesn't matter and the the city council doesn't care um not all members of city council i think i are think indifferent, they all need to go but I, I i think they should all go i'm disappointed in, in charlie hales in the sense that um someone had to have given the um the the commanders that order and i believe the police were heard saying by order of yes. the, of the mayor yes now they would not have said that on their own yeah. they were instructed to say that yeah. by order of the mayor and i'm sure they were glad to say it too because it protects them and they knew they were wrong yeah it, it wasn't handled as well as it could have been definitely um i know that one police officer was injured he fell i've seen the video many times um, unfortunately, I think that the last part of the video um, is just to, uh, encapsulates a couple of seconds, but it's going to become symbolic in a way for the way the citizens are excluded from this political process is the part of the video towards the end where um, one of the police sergeants pushes Jesse Sponberg, who becomes airborne and... Um, and then uh, Teresa Rayford throws yeah. a sandwich over the head. I don't like Jesse Sponberg, and I'm all for <laughs> pushing him out of buildings. But this, is not, this is not the way that a free city treats its citizens. Right. I, I was. I was. I didn't know it was Jesse at first yeah. until he. You know. I was. It, it's just unfortunate because it's such a. It's such a visual of yeah. of um, the situation in Portland, and when we have this protest happening and the protesters being mistreated like this on the heels of scandal in the 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 chief's office you know the chief uh, the, the former police chief being um you know uh, drunk and accidentally shooting his friend uh, you know lying and then several other people lying and people resigning quickly you know or retiring quickly um it's it's embarrassing portland it is has a real problem right now it is embarrassing and it, historically it fits exactly with what's going on we have the most corrupt city government that we've had in a generation right now. Um, I haven't seen anything like it in, in Portland since the 40s and 50s when, when things were at just about their worst. Yeah. Uh, but we're back to that point now. And every time we have a corrupt mayor, corrupt city council, we end up with the problems that we've got in Portland right now. Mm -hmm. The police command um, force is decimated. Uh, they don't have a command anymore. Uh, heroin addiction is at all-time highs in the city yeah. in the city we yeah. have more homeless people than we've ever had the homeless situation the streets is, are not safe is anymore. unbelievable everywhere you go these homeless camps dot the city in in residential and industrial areas it's unbelievable I've lived here my whole life and I have never seen it this bad in 2016 yeah. it is worse now than it has ever been yeah. at any other time and Charlie Hales thinks it's important enough to call it an emergency but then not do anything about it. Yeah. Nothing, not anything has been done. Right, and of course, the Wapato situation. Wapato remains empty, $58 million building built in 2003, and Loretta, uh, Loretta Smith wrote an editorial recently that was published in the Portland Tribune. Um, she wants to see Wapato turned into a homeless shelter, and I support her, absolutely. Well, I mean, we need shelters. Yeah. We need shelters because there's people sleeping on the street, but the the, Homeless activists are trying to make it legal for them to stay on the street. 
I don't want to live in a tent. How many people right. want to live in tents? What we need is housing that is right. affordable in this town. We need yeah. cooperative housing yeah. that is affordable. I agree. Um, and, and, and homeless people shouldn't, they shouldn't have to sleep on the streets. They or, shouldn't. Or in a shelter. Yeah. Yeah. But we need the shelters because they have to get inside. Yeah. Um, I've read a couple of articles about Wapato, and one of the arguments is that it would it would cost too much to run it, um, and so they've. I mean, it's been thirteen, I think almost thirteen years now, and it costs five hundred thousand dollars a year to maintain it, and it's, it's, and it's being it's yeah. it's been used literally only as a movie set, you know. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's pretty That's ridiculous. Important. That is important. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> well. I'm I guess. particularly incensed by Wapato because yeah. uh, a lot of people remember I ran for Multnomah County right. Sheriff in 2006, yeah. and that was one of my platform right. points. We need to do something with Wapato. And, of course, the buzz is, well, we can't do that because the bonding says we had to do this for a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. I, as sheriff, was willing to say to hell with all that. I take the keys, and me and some homeless people go down and open the doors, and we turn on the lights. The sheriff at that time made $130,000 a year. I was willing to give up $30,000 of my salary to turn the light on. Now we turn the lights on, so if we're going to use it as a homeless shelter because there's dormitories, medical facility, plenty of room for schools, underserved medical, underserved children for medicine, that's what it should have been used yes. for. I was willing to take the lawsuit bullshit. Yeah. So sue me. Yeah. But in the meantime, we're getting people off the street. Yeah. We're, get, we're getting them in a shelter. The other confusing part to me was the homeless uh, business, the people that actually run the shelters, well, they didn't want to go out there that way out there to a jail either. Well, you know what? <laughs> Tough. Exactly. It's Tough. not a business. It's this not is a not business. a business. That's right. Uh, they, well, they couldn't get them out there. It would be too hard. Well, we got shuttle buses. We'll take care of that. That's not a problem. Every problem they brought up, nonsense. Yeah. Turn on the lights, open the doors. Uh, probably one of the things that made people mad about my idea was I was also going to use it as a nice place to go marijuana for people who had medical <laughs> business. I mean, it's fenced in. You were ahead in. of your time. It's fenced in. Mm -hmm. We have deputies mm -hmm. to guard it. I mm -hmm. mean, what a wonderful situation it could have been. Yeah. So now we're... Now we're here 10 years later, 2006 when I ran for sheriff, here we are 10 years later, it's still sitting vacant. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody ought to go to jail just for that. I agree with you on no. that. I agree. Somebody ought to go to jail. Why hasn't one of these sheriffs stood up, done something about it? Why hasn't some strong leader said, sue me? Yeah. In the meantime, I'm going to be, take care of these people and get them off the street. Okay, I think we're getting ready for the <clears> break <throat> and uh, we'll be right back. I'm infuriated by that. I know. Me too. Me too. <clears throat> so, so we're on a break. Yeah. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend.
Hello, you're back on Oregon Voters Digest, and we're sitting here talking today with my husband, Don Dupe, and J.D. Chandler, writer and author, and we're talking about Portland politics and recent uh, events at City Hall. So, and, and the police bureau, really, the contract to me is not the big issue of this latest protest. Mm -hmm. The biggest issue to me is the way Charlie Hales has, has handled himself as mm -hmm. mayor. He acts like a dictator. He's not our dictator. I mm -hmm. think he needs to be kicked out of office. Mm -hmm. I know he's leaving, but we need to give him a good boot to send him on his way. Um, I also believe that our city council is the most corrupt that we've had uh, since the 50s. And I think that they all need to be voted out of office. So do you, do you feel like all the city council members? I'm, tar I'm using a wide brush right mm -hmm. now. I don't know who's corrupt and who's not corrupt on that city council. I think they all should go. Um, and then we can just watch. I, I personally admire Amanda Fritz a great deal, and I feel okay. like it's really important to have a woman on city council. Um, and I also think that um, Nick Fish has, has done, he's got a really incredible resume for, in terms of working for social justice. Huh. Um, but, but I know that um, there are some people that feel like um, we need just new blood all around. I'm all for having women on the council. I think we need more than just one. Yeah. And I think that we need new people on the council. Mm -hmm. We need new people who will be held accountable. Mm -hmm. yeah. We need to prove, because the one thing that this city has never done in our entire history is we have never proved that we will not stand for corrupt city government. Mm -hmm. We have complained about it, we've protested when, about it, we've done a lot of things, but we have never held them accountable. When we talk about corrupt city government, I think racism is a huge part of it. Absolutely. Because let's face it, city council is white controlled, yep. the media in Portland is very white controlled, yep. and I personally have, have recently come out against that. I've written three articles um, in support of Fred Stewart, who I feel like was, I feel like Fred was, was singled out and treated very unfairly. Um, and his, his private life was uh, exposed in a very unfair, um, stereotyping manner. Um, and that made me angry. You know, I, I don't know a lot about racism. I'm not a person of color. I'm only learning recently. Um, but what happened to Fred Stewart made me very angry. And so that's why I wrote, I wrote about it. But um, I think that um, when we talk about corruption in, in city council, I think that racism is a huge part of it. Well, the fact that we've had very few black members of the city right. council over the years, and right. when black people run for office, their character is assassinated. Exactly. I think that that right. shows why. And, and that's exactly what happened right. with Fred. Nigel Jaquist of Willamette Week and Steve Dean of The Oregonian um, wrote editorials or commentaries that were really, um, really good examples of yellow journalism. Um, they were um, sensational, sensationalistic. They were, um, they were unfair. They were um, basically trying to disguise uh, opinion as fact, and and and, they, and it was a terrible thing that happened to Fred. Um, he was he was he was stereotyped as the archetypal uh, Negro savage, yeah. and and I think that that's really wrong because I know Fred. He's a wonderful person, and he would have been ideal to have on city council. I think. Um, this goes back a while too. We go back to the time when Charles Jordan right. was city commissioner and he <clears throat> was in charge of the police bureau at that particular time. Mm -hmm. and, he, Th and I believe he's the only city council member who was not the mayor who controlled the police bureau. Yes, yeah. but he was assigned that bureau mm -hmm. by the mayor, who was uh, uh, Ivan C. at the time. Yeah. So here we have him and he's trying to make some changes. He's the one that fired the cops that threw possums right. in the neighborhood of uh, the, burger the, the burger bar. Yeah. Right. And then Ivancy, the mayor, didn't like that and removed him from control of the police bureau. <laughs> right. So yeah. here we have the white leadership yep. you know, doing it to the to the black leadership that is there. Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of <clears throat> white guy okay, bad guy, black guy bad yep. going on in City Hall mm -hmm. for a long time ago. Yep. Yeah. From a long time yeah, ago. Exactly. And then Ivan C I think it was him that yeah, it was Ivan C that appointed Ron Still chief of police. I believe that's correct. And he went Ron Still was not a captain, so it was unusual but fine with me that they go back, they go down and pick someone of a lower rank to lead the police department. Unfortunately, he was not a good one to pick. <laughs> he was not a good one to pick. He had a history I personally know about, some of the terrible things that he did and the terrible things that he proposed 
So combined with uh, the bad decision and, and, and the poor leadership, it was a huge affront to the black community yeah. Yeah. that made racism worse here. Yeah. Uh, Ron Still, as chief of police, didn't help the matter. Right. He made it. He made the matter worse, and Charles Jordan was shuffled aside and muted. So. Yep. Exactly. And, and another <laughs> aspect, I think, of the of the systemic corruption in Portland politics and city council is, um, as I mentioned before, the the media. Um, there's an article that we read. Um, by the Portland Tribune, um, feud erupts over activism style, and it's about this exchange of words that Teresa Rayford and Joanne Hardesty had. And you had some really interesting ideas about the fact that she's with, uh, Hardesty is with the NAACP, Teresa Rayford is with Don't Shoot Portland, and the purpose of this type of article. Yes, it, it, it bothers me. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People here in Portland, where the oldest chapter west of the Mississippi, founded in 1912, um, and it's been a very prickly organization. It tends to be conservative, mm -hmm. um, and it is always used, especially in the Portland press, as a way to drive a wedge into the black community. Right. Um, and this is a perfect example of that. This little spat between, mm -hmm. was it Joanne Hardesty and, right. and Teresa Rayford, uh, reading it in the paper, it sounds like two little kids who are mad at each other. Right. And that, that it's a personal problem, mm -hmm. but it's being turned into a political problem that can split the black community. Mm -hmm. Teresa and Joanne, just settle your differences and everybody else stop buying into this stuff. Mm -hmm. We're all working for the same thing. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. Um, I know that um, Teresa Rayford posted on her Facebook, she doesn't want people to take sides. It's not important um, and that we, people need to just- And she's right. Yeah. And Teresa Rayford is doing really good political organizing in this city. Yeah. I, my personal criticism of Don't Shoot Portland is they need to be more committed to nonviolence. Right. And they need to do totally. extensive nonviolence training. I agree, I agree. Uh, and other than that, what they're doing is right. And a lot of that, um, that methodology is explained in Gene Sharp's books um, about nonviolent protest. And um, it, it really is the only way that they're gonna have any real success exactly. as, a, as a group nationally. Exactly, but, or um, even in Portland. Yeah. Um, but they're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just the way they're doing it needs to be yeah. disciplined a little bit more. I agree with them, I disagree with their tactics. Me too. Yeah. Because <coughs> the, the reality is that when you shut down highways, when you shut down streets, and when you prevent regular working class citizens from getting home to care for their children, to feed their elderly parents, to get to work, to survive, you're not going to be um, creating any sympathy with, well, with your cause. I'll disagree with you. Sometimes blocking the freeway is the only way to go. Well, it's I, know. A, I know. It's a, I know it's a controversial <laughs> tactic, but sometimes it's, it's it must be done. It's the wrong people to complain to. If you want to, I'm, I'm more for surrounding City Hall. Well, yeah. I agree. I agree I'm more for too. surrounding City like Hall or surrounding the mayor's house and blocking the street. Because the people who block the street just get pissed off. Yeah. I know I'm going to get nowhere in this argument, <laughs> but sometimes well, blocking the street has to be done. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I should have had you at a police car years ago. <laughs> <laughs> With handcuffs? No. no. <laughs> right along. Right Don has his original handcuffs from when he was a patrolman. <laughs> they have his name engraved on them. I've nice. seen them. So I wanted to ask about, um, well, anyway, I just wanted to mention also um, this August 28th, 2016 um, article that Loretta Smith wrote about the Wapato Jail. Loretta um, Smith is a county commissioner. Right. Okay. What did I say? You just, you just didn't say. Okay, all right. She's the county commissioner. And she makes um, a really good point when she um, includes in this editorial that there, it has all the beds, kitchens, and bathrooms to function as a homeless shelter. You know, it has everything that's needed. Um, Wapato is a taxpayer-funded project that costs $58 million to build. And, quote, we are missing a giant opportunity to use the Wapato shelter, uh, the Wapato facility as a shelter. And I just totally agree with her and I hope that she continues to um, fight for that um, but uh, but anyway I also just wanted to ask you guys what, what your thoughts are about the, the presidential race and you know <laughs> wow there's a switch <laughs> he's uh, Donald Trump um, has recently been described as a national embarrassment I would agree with that yeah. I would agree with that yeah, yeah. It, yeah. to tell you the truth <laughs> I, I 
I almost hate to say this, but I am glad that my grandparents are not alive mm -hmm. to see this election. Yeah. I would be embarrassed uh, for them to see yeah. what we've done to presidential elections yeah. in this country. I, I, I agree. Um, I, I've never seen anything like this in my whole life. Um, someone who has absolutely no experience in politics, who's not really very intelligent, um, who they say, some, some people say that he um, operates at, I think, a sixth grade verbal level. Um, and um, to <laughs> but not an A sixth grade <laughs> right <Well>. right <laughs> but um, just you know everything that he everything he said everything he's done it's as if he can't he can't open his mouth without 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 making himself look moronic yeah. and um, and I, I have think a solution. you have a solution <laughs> I have a solution the whole problem is with campaign spending and how much money they throw this is true my solution is this if the job pays a hundred thousand dollars a year you may spend only 150000 to get it. Mm -hmm. That would keep all of the television ads off. That would yeah. make the candidate go yeah. out shaking hands, like right. they did when they, when, uh, they rode on the back of trains. Exactly. And did whistle stops. Right. Exactly. You know, and talk to people. Yeah. Exactly. You know, uh, the mayor here, he, he makes, I don't know how much he makes, but over $100,000 a year. He shouldn't be spending millions no. of dollars to get it. No, that's insane. Because what it does is it... Is it it's it, not it, about the money, it's right. about the power. Right. You spend millions and millions and millions electing a president. <laughs> it's just crazy yeah. the way... It's crazy the money they throw at it. Yeah. It's crazy. Well, we need to overturn the Citizens United uh, decision because yes. that, that equates that corporate spending yeah. with the First Amendment, which yeah. is insane. Right. A corporation is not a person. Right, and so, in corporate personhood. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's... My spending limit idea would solve the problem. Yeah, it would. actually, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, well, it's a good idea. Yeah. Let's yeah. do it. Okay, <coughs> let's do it. I, I will. <laughs> <laughs> and, and recently, I, I think it was yesterday I read, that Donald Trump is incensed now about the SNL, the SNL skits. <laughs> the skits of him and... SNL and uh, they're so funny. They're really amusing, oh, they and, and they're they, they have so many little grains of truth in them. You know the way he was stalking Hillary Clinton during the second well, debate. Well, I, I love how they uh, what's her name, Kate, whatever her right. name is, the who, actress. Who She's amazing. I love the way they oh. tease Hillary Clinton because yeah, Hillary Clinton is going to make a fun president. I think so. Uh, to me, though, she is Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like her. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with her on most <laughs> things. Yeah. I'd much rather have her as president than anyone else. Uh, right you now. know, it, it comes down to That's the terrible. lesser of two evils. I mean, she's. she's. It's not even really the lesser <laughs> of two evils to me. Um, Hillary Clinton is committed to this country yeah, and yeah. our democracy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I have no doubt of that. We have serious um, issues with Russia right now. We could mm -hmm. be at I war know. with Russia before the election. I know, I know. Um, we need someone who understands how to deal with those problems, I think, and Hillary does. I think for me, um, watching the first debate was so enlightening, and seeing Donald Trump, seeing how completely out of his league he was, how inept he was, and listening to her, and the language that she used, and men you know, mentioning the, the, the thing that so many people worry about, someone like him having access to the nuclear codes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, what, that's what people are scared of. Yeah. He's so unpredictable, he's so, you know, out of control. Um, he's just so unpresidential. Yeah. <laughs> well, he asked some of the generals, well, why can't we use little nukes? Yeah. <laughs> little nukes. Why can't we nuke them? Why can't we nuke them? Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, oh, good. Oh, good. let me explain that to you. <laughs> <laughs> but, um... Oh, I hate to say this, too, but the re one of the reasons I voted for Jimmy Carter years ago was because he was a commander of a nuclear submarine. Exactly. That guy understood nuclear power. He did. Sure. And I voted for him for that reason. I, I still consider Jimmy Carter one of the best presidents yeah. of my lifetime. Yeah. Me I too. met him. I met Jimmy Carter. Did you? I met Jimmy Carter at Powell's um, when he came to Portland for a little Vanity Press a book on fishing, fishing and life, and um, he signed two of books and mm -hmm. I actually spoke to him. And he was, uh, it was probably 20 or 25 years ago. It was a pretty interesting experience. Most he's people been one of forget our, he was a Navy man. Yeah, they do. Well, and and he was, he's, he's been one of our greatest ex-presidents, too. He has. I mean, he's just, yeah. he has such integrity, and, and he's so beloved. You know, um, there's no question that he was, he tried to take on too much. I mean, yeah. he was aged so much during the time he was president because he was just trying to be a micromanager because it was so important to him. Everything was so important. And he understood the, the you know, the complexities of um, international 
political relations and basically things that Donald Trump just doesn't have a clue about. Yeah. Um, but I, I've never seen anything like this in my life. Yeah. This current presidential race is just unlike anything I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, and we're, I mean, as a country, we're kind of a laughing stock yeah. around the world. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's true. It Donald is true. Trump is a, he's a joke, you yeah, know, he is and a joke. it's just, <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing. But so. you know, do we have time for one more topic? <laughs> yeah, Should yeah. Because yeah? Don and I were talking earlier about some of his ideas about reforming the police bureau. Yes. Oh, that's Let's right. Go back to the Don, City you've thing. got some really good ideas about this stuff. Yeah. Well, when uh, when some of my friends were running for office in the recent election, I put forth a five-year re re plan to re to re to re reform the police, and <clears throat> the immediate thing that I would do is get rid of the black uniforms. They go immediately back to the friendly blue. If if we did that, it would make the national it news. Would. It would make the national news. It would news. make the national news. They keep talking about the thin blue line. It's not blue anymore. It's yeah. black. That's true. Yeah. It wouldn't be the Hill Street blue, it would be Hill Street blacks. So we need to get rid of <laughs> we need to get rid of the blue yeah. uniforms and go the back. The black the black uniforms. I would also put some of the officers, volunteers at first, back in jackets and slacks. Hmm. Just like detectives. Yeah. And that will work because you've got the same body armor, you got the same thing you can wear with a suit, but you don't look like a jerk. <laughs> you don't look like the ninja. Right. There's too much we them. We need to look like us. I agree. That's one thing the hardest he talks about. They need to look like us. Well, put them in a suit and a pair of slacks. Mm -hmm. That was actually done in California, and I think it was San Diego or San right. Jose who did it. San Diego. And mm -hmm. the reason they stopped because citizens were complaining, we don't see policemen anymore. <laughs> So, yeah. and the other thing is, <clears throat> that's the first thing I do. Then the reorganization is, and, and they're forced to do it in some of these things right now that I'm reading here on the urgency of the staffing crisis, is that the Portland Police Bureau is going to resign, reassign 20 officers and sergeants from specialty units. Right. Okay, that's always been my bitch about it in the first place, is somehow or other they got too specialized. Mm -hmm. We have a traffic division, and I was out at the traffic division, which is now uh, the old St. John City Hall, about a year ago, and spoke to the sergeant in charge of the traffic division. He told me there were 22 motorcycle officers. Okay, 22 cops, that's 11 two-man cars. Those guys back on the street. Internal Affairs has 11 or 12 people that are doing nothing but whitewashing police complaints. <laughs> Those guys need to be put back in uniform and back on the street. So we have the potential of having 15 or 20 more cops in cars on the street. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean traffic tickets aren't going to be written? No. It means you're a generalist. If you see a violator, and I see him every day, yeah. you stop and give him a ticket. If you get a suicide call, you take that. If you get a homicide call, you take that and call the detectives. Yes. But... The other problem with it is, is that the traffic division has no purpose except to create revenue. Right. We should not have an entire bunch of policemen doing running around, doing nothing but creating revenue. Okay, writing tacket, traffic tickets should have never, in my opinion, been about revenue in the first place. Right. It's about you break the law, you get a ticket, but it's not about revenue. These guys are out on their motorcycles writing tickets for revenue. That has to stop. And apparently it's going to stop because they can't afford to do it anymore. <laughs> There's too much specialization. Yeah. What uh, are your thoughts <clears throat> about rehiring some of the retired cops that were really valued? I think, I personally, I think that's probably a good idea. I do too. I do <clears throat> as long too. as the officer wants to do that. Yeah. You know, but uh, I, that's a short-term solution to a big mm -hmm. problem. We yeah. have an experienced policeman that's a cadre of retirement. And they can go back and go to work if they want to. Mm -hmm. Training and training a new policeman is well, yeah. and I think that's something that the, a lot of civilians don't understand is that training a new policeman mm -hmm. takes a lot of time mm -hmm. and money and, and money. money and it takes years. Yeah. And that's the reason that um, veteran seasoned police officers are so valued is because of what they know. Right. And yet they're often discriminated by people mm -hmm. in the vocal minority and and mm -hmm. other people who presume that because they're veterans somehow they're corrupt. Yeah. Somehow. Sure. They're, and there is you know, that there is that perception. But the the important issue that we are going to have to solve is how do we inspire young people to become cops? Right. Especially here. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. I'm sorry, but my book says if you want to be a policeman, don't do it. <laughs> I, well, and you know, overall, that's good advice. It's good advice. It's uh, but it's bad for the police. It's bad for the police. Well, and the other thing is this: there's this ideology that's been springing up lately. I know that Joanne Hardesty uh, condones it or espouses it that we don't need the police. We can somehow solve these kinds yeah. of problems ourselves. I have to say that ideology is ludicrous. It will never work. Um, you can't take untrained civilians and say, okay, here's a hostage situation, don't screw up. Right. Or here's a serial killer, don't screw up. Right. Good luck trying to find that serial killer. Yeah. You know, it, it's ridiculous. It, and, it, and it harkens back, I think, to um, concepts of anarchy. And it's just, it's absurd. And I just have to say that. It, well. just, it makes me laugh when I hear people say, <laughs> we don't need the police department. We need to have less police officers in Portland. Baloney. Yeah, Baloney. I don't think that's... It won't uh, work. Solution to anything. I, yeah. I know far too much about the history of murder in this town right. to a think yeah. that they're ever going to stop, right. and b think that other than professional investigators, anyone's ever going to solve them. Yeah, and you know, I, I talk to my friends on Facebook, and, and sometimes we get into disagreements. Um, but one thing I always go back to, and I don't care how it sounds, but the nature of, of mankind is, is savage, and we prove that every year. My friend Tim doesn't agree with me, but we prove that every year with the murders and the rapes and the child molestation. It's savage and and we most civilized societies have always had some kind of a police system and most civilized societies will always have a yeah. police system. Well I don't you know, know about the word savage, but I do know that the streak of violence in American society is deep and wide. That's what I mean. Yeah. When I say savage I mean violence. Mm -hmm. Because violence is savage. It's it is, you know, and having been you know, the victim of, of sexual assault and, and domestic violence, that's the word that I sure. that I like to use because it really encapsulates, you know, my, my feeling yeah. that, you know, I, I really believe that, you know, of course I believe that people are good and I have, I have positive beliefs too, but I think that our veneer of civility is very thin mm -hmm. and as long as we're clothed, fed, housed, we can maintain that veneer, but when you take those things away, people kill each other mm -hmm. for alpha bread. Yeah. You well, know? <laughs> that sure happens. It sure but, does. Um, a seasoned investigator is something that doesn't happen overnight. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I spent five years, six years, running the streets as a street cop before I was eligible to take the police uh, detective exam. Detective exam. Yeah. And you should have five or six years mm -hmm. on the street. Now just you only so need you know three. What you're talking about. Yeah. Well, that's, now, that's a big now, mistake too. Yeah. That is a mistake. They changed that, I think, <clears> in the late '60s, right? Yeah. yeah. So you need you need to have that time and that experience to be a seasoned investigator. And then after you get your job as a detective, then it takes you a while to become an expert in the field you're working in. Exactly. Right. Uh, homicide investigation is different than burglary investigation. Right. Uh, auto theft, which never really was really a crime, you know. <laughs> but uh, auto theft. I'm just looking fraud. at the development of those laws. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so you have this investment. Right. And people don't realize that when people like Harder say, well, let's defund the police. Right, we don't need All police. Right. <laughs> okay. And then deal with the wild, wild west. Then what are you going to do? You know? then, then you do have anarchy right. in yeah. the wild, right. wild west. Then everybody's right. got a gun and you're the target. I yeah. think one of the, one of the main problems <clears throat> with, with the perception of police is that police departments, police officers, don't feel like they can explain these kinds of things. They, there's this code of silence. They are attacked, they're accused of horrible things, they don't defend themselves, they don't feel like they can. And that's one of the reasons I interviewed, I interviewed eight police officers, because I wanted to give them an opportunity, most of them were retired, um, to, including you, <laughs> to um, just share their experiences in, a, in a, an atmosphere that was respectful and, and positive, because so many police don't feel like they can defend themselves. And the, the rule of thumb is, be quiet, don't say anything, don't talk to the press, don't talk to the media. And, and too many citizens equate that with guilt, you know, and uh, it's just, it's really sad. Um, but I agree with you, Don, that it is an investment, it takes years, and mm -hmm. too many people, too many um, liberal uh, members of the vocal minority, just liberals in general, think they understand all of the aspects of criminal justice and police work when they don't, they don't have any background. For example, that group, what was it called? The police review group we applied for, oh, yeah. and they didn't <coughs> choose us. 
and um, Coab. Right, Coab. And they did Citizens Oversight Board. Right. And um, <coughs> and we applied and we um, both sat down and wrote really very, very nice essays as to why we would be a benefit to that group. They chose um, a multitude of different people from totally different backgrounds. I don't think any one that they chose had a background in either criminology mm -hmm. or police uh, law enforcement. And it, it dissolved just in less than a year. Mm -hmm. you know? And then they, they emailed us back and said, would you reconsider? And by then we were too busy. No. <laughs> and that's something we've been trying to establish for decades. And mm -hmm. uh, Citizen oversight? Yes. Yeah. It's Absolutely. not going to happen except from the inside. <clears throat> I hate to beat the drum. <laughs> 14th Amendment has to be has to be upheld. You cannot yeah. have special justice for the police. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree. It's just messed so up. So basically what you're saying is that <clears throat> internal affairs internal needs affairs to go. Internal affairs is unconstitutional. unconstitutional. The, the, Consti the 14th Amendment is very clear. It says equal justice right. for all. The Constitution says you can't have a slave and mm -hmm. you can't have special justice. Right. So why do we have this in our police contract? Mm -hmm. My point of view as a pseudo lawyer, your contract is not valid if it contains something that violates the Constitution. Right. Mm -hmm. It can't be. Yeah. Now, why hasn't that been attacked? Well, that hasn't been attacked <laughs> because everybody's afraid of taking on the cops. It, yeah. it, and it's all, it, it, it would also be a huge endeavor to actually make that work. I mean, how would we be able to get rid of internal affairs Simple. in Portland? You transfer them out. You okay. don't work here anymore. There mm -hmm. is no more internal affairs. Mm -hmm. Now we got the office space, we got the budget, we're going to put all that into more police cars, mm -hmm. hire more policemen. It is a precinct level problem. Uh -huh. They have a captain, they have sergeants, they have lieutenants, they have investigators, they have office space, they have typists. But then who polices the police? Who polices the police? <laughs> the mayor and the chief. I mean, the citizen, the commission, the, is city going, council. the city council is going to be the ones that are going to take care of this problem. They are going to replace internal affairs, in my book. And a policeman is that accused is, of a crime. That is the original way we did it. Yeah. And the police were held more accountable for their actions. Sure. And it has to go back to that. Yeah. It has to go back to that. Because that's what people keep being mad about, is the police are never held accountable. Okay. They will never be held accountable. We're going to have to wrap up now. Um, Good. This was a wonderful <laughs> discussion. <laughs> And um, we want to wish Bruce Broussard a happy birthday. Yes. Happy birthday, Bruce. Yes, Bruce. And also we hope that he's, that he's feeling better very soon. And uh, join us again for another episode of Oregon Voters Digest.